Aloha. There's a new study that was printed um, in Time Magazine this morning in the online article. Um, I get, you know, the Time Magazine updates two or three times a day, so, you know, when I see these types of things, I print them out and here I am. Uh, this one is a low-fat diet may lower the risk of dying from breast cancer. <sighs> um, it was written by Alice Park and published today, May 15th. Um, breast cancer treatment, oh, forget, the, forget that part. Um, this was a study that was presented at the annual American Society of Clinical Oncology. Um, Oh, it will be presented next month at this Clinical Oncology Society thing. <laughs> um, the, ana the study was analyzed data from the Women's Health Initiative, which is a trial sponsored by the National Institutes of Health. And um, in this one, they chose a group of nearly 49,000 women who were randomly assigned to follow either a low-fat diet or a control diet for eight and a half years. Um, the low-fat diet, the aim was to reduce fat intake by 20% and to increase the consumption of fruit, vegetables, and grains. None of the women theoretically had breast cancer when they started this. Um, you know, if they did have it, it wasn't known. And after the study ended, the rates of new breast cancers were about the same in the two groups. But women who were diagnosed with breast cancer in the interim had a 35% lower risk of dying from any cause compared to those on the control diet. And let's see, um, the trial was led by Dr. Rowan Schlebowski, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, who was with the LA Biomedical Research Institute at Harbor UCLA Medical Center. Um, and he says, this is, very this is a very exciting result for us. I don't know why. Um, they're saying now we have randomized, randomized clinical trial evidence that dietary moderation, which is achievable by many, can have health benefits including reducing risk of death from breast cancer. <sighs> randomized evidence. Does this make any sense to anybody else? And then later in the article it says, until it, it's a, another quote from Schlebowski, until this study we lacked any data from a prospective randomized control trial, which is the gold standard for showing that a dietary approach really does reduce the risk of dying from cancer. Oh no, sorry, that wasn't Schlebowski, Schle, Schlebowski that was Dr. Neil Eingar a medical oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center who was not involved in the study. Um, in a separate sub-study, uh, they showed that the longer women were on the modified diet, the lower their risk of death during the study period. And then, well, the study did not find a significant connection between dietary changes and the incidence of new breast cancer. Right there, they said it. No connection. Um, the results do suggest that modifying the diet can lower a woman's risk of dying from any cause or from breast cancer if she is diagnosed with the disease. Okay, let's break this down a little bit. Low-fat diet. Okay, if someone is on a low-fat diet, aren't they 
healthier than someone who is not on a low fat diet. And from what I've seen, people who are on low fat diets tend to exercise more. Diet, exercise, weight loss, healthier living. Hello? To me, it seems like it's not so much the low fat diet, it is the lifestyle that we've already gone over this in previous um, studies. The healthier lifestyle. Now myself, I was on a low fat diet for two or three years before I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Granted, I'm still alive at this point. Who knows tomorrow? But then they said that uh, the results do suggest that modifying the diet can lower a woman's risk of dying from any cause, which happens to include breast cancer. So I'm guessing that next we'll come out with a study that says a low-fat diet will reduce your uh, risk of heart disease or cancer, or not cancer, but or strokes or heart attacks. Duh! And then at the very end they say, well, the study did not find a significant connection between dietary changes and the incidence of new breast cancer. They said it right here. Yet the title is, a low-fat diet may lower the risk of dying from cancer. Yet they, they don't have a connection. Let me know what your take on this is. Comment down below. Because I'm kind of going bunk. You know, why are they spending money on studies like this when they should be, you know, this is something that's been proven. Low-fat diets are healthier diets than full-fat diets. We know that. Give us something new something that definitively says this will cut your risk of breast cancer or any other cancer. Let me know what you think. Comment down below. And I'll talk to you the next time I have something update. Bye-bye. Okay, I am going to add on to what I just filmed because uh, this morning when I was on my way to work, there was a news article on NPR talking about this same study and they brought up the fact that first of all the study is not monitored um, you know what people ate was not monitored they ate within this food group but whatever they wanted calorie intake was not monitored food intake was not monitored um, it was just self-reporting for the most part there's a big error when somebody is self-reporting um, or an error factor and so I went back to the actual publication um, and found the the abstract on the effect of low-fat diet on breast cancer survival the background says, even though many studies have examined the possible effect of low-fat diet on breast cancer survival, the relationship remains unclear. And let's see, so it went on and described their methods, how they just pulled from all these previous clinical trials. Um, and. The results were post-diagnostic, low-fat diet, post-diagnostic, not pre. This is after they've had breast cancer, after they've been diagnosed with breast cancer. Low-fat diet reduced risk of recurrence 
of breast cancer by 23% and all-cause mortality of breast cancer by 17%. This doesn't take into effect what you've been eating for 20 years. This doesn't take into effect the low-fat diet you've been on for the last two years. You can still get breast cancer, but if you continue the low-fat diet, your risk of dying is less. Again, the low-fat diet better for you than high-fat diet. We already know that. So the conclusion, um, suggests that the low-fat diet can improve breast cancer survival by reducing risk of recurrence. Okay. However, more trials of the relationship between low-fat diet and all-cause mortality of breast cancer are still needed. So this really didn't, this study really didn't do anything except say, hey, we need more studies. Those are the ones I hate. It, it's like, give me a reason, you know, why are you even wasting money on this when you already know, you know, when it's, they've been studied and, you know, create a study that determines why and what the relationship is. Okay, so then, in today's Time, um, Time Magazine, there was another study. Here's what eating processed foods for two weeks does to your body. This correlates to the other study, so that's why I'm putting it in here. It was written by Mandy Oaklander, and again Time Magazine Online, um, and it says ultra-processed foods um, make up as much as 60 percent of the average American diet. And yes, I, as a single person, I rarely cooked. Unless I could microwave it, it just didn't make much sense. Um, and ultra-processed foods have high sugar, fat, salt content. Okay, so what they did was, and this was published in the journal Cell Metabolism. Um, And it says, when people ate a highly processed diet for two weeks, they consumed more calories and gained more weight and body fat than they did when they ate a less processed diet. Um, even though both diets have the same amount of nutrients like sugar, fat, and sodium. Okay, so while they say it wasn't a shock to find ultra-processed foods weren't healthy, thank you for admitting that. Um, other research has linked them to a higher risk of cancer and obesity. And the one thing that they didn't expect was that they found sugar, fat, and salt didn't seem to be what was driving people to overeat, which is what we've always thought or been told. Um, you know, it's, you know, like you crave the grease, you crave the salt, you crave the sugar, and um, we've always kind of been told. Okay, so sugar, fat, and salt weren't what seems to be driving people to overeat. Um, you know, we've been told for years and we believed that, um, you know, we crave the oil, we crave, you know, the, we crave the grease, we crave the sugar, we crave the starches, and um, it, you know, if we're eating those, we tend to eat more of them. And because both diets had the same amount of salt, sugar, and um, fat, they and the people on the better diet were not overeating, they figured out that those weren't the things that were doing it. Um, so... Kevin Hall, lead author of the study and senior investigator, this is a long one, at the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases at the National Institutes of Health. Hope I got everything, Kevin. Um, he says, it's the first trial that can actually demonstrate that there is a casual relationship between something about ultra-processed foods, independent of those nutrients, the salt, sugar, fat, 
that cause people to overeat and gain weight. So in this study, um, 20 healthy adults lived for a month in a lab. All of their meals and snacks were prepared for them. So this is a very intensive, you know, this is monitored. You're not just self-reporting what you ate. Um, you know, and I can attest to that. Before I had my bariatric surgery, I had to log everything I ate. I would forget to log something in, or if I splurged and ate you know, an ice cream or something that I wasn't supposed to eat, I might not have put it in. I tried to be honest, but at the same time, I think our brain kind of goes, okay, um, you had one and a half scoops, just put one scoop down, you know, things like that. Um, so the two meal plans were either highly processed or unprocessed, and everyone ate one for two weeks at a time, then switched to the other. So you ate for two weeks, you ate the highly processed food, and then for two weeks, you ate the unprocessed food. Um, foods like canned ravioli, chicken nuggets, bagels, and diet lemonade were in the ultra-processed diet. And salads, scrambled eggs, oatmeal, and nuts were in the unprocessed diet. So right away, you can see the difference between the two diets. Um, both diets were nearly identical in nutrient profiles. Same amount of sugar, fat, sodium, fiber, and more. I don't know what more is, but... Um, but when people ate the highly processed diet, they ate about 500 more calories a day, and they also gained about two pounds over the course of the two weeks they were on that diet. Um, and they also lost about two pounds when they were on the unprocessed diet. They also, on the highly processed diet, they ate faster, which could be, which they said could be one reason that they gained more weight. Um, because ultra, -pro this is back to Hall with the long, uh, ultra processed foods tend to be softer, which makes it easier to chew and swallow. Um, one of the theories is that if you're eating more quickly, you're not giving your gut enough time to signal to your brain that you've had enough calories and that you're full and to stop eating. By the time the brain gets that signal, it's too late, you've already overeaten. That's another thing I can attest to because now that my stomach is just this big, it is very easy to overeat. And I actually, when I was on my former health plan, I would go to... Um, what do they call them? Like support groups. And, you know, every couple of weeks we, we met and everybody who was either interested in the surgery or had had the surgery, was going through the surgery, you know, every, we'd all meet and we'd talk about, we'd answer, if you already had the surgery, you could answer questions for the people who were thinking about it. And everybody would talk about how, oh, now I know when I'm full. And I still don't know. You know, I'm three years after my surgery and I still don't know when I'm full until I'm over full. So somewhere that trigger gets lost in me. And so I have to visually and, you know, really mentally think about what I'm eating. Otherwise, I will get too full. I will get sick and throw everything up. It's very easy to do. Um, but the difference is before my surgery, I would just, at some point, I would feel full. But it was already too late and there was no throwing up. There was no getting rid of it. I would just feel full. And I also learned that I ate by taste. I still do. If something tastes good, I want to keep eating it. Even if I start feeling full, I want to keep eating it until it's all gone. And it took me a long, long, it took 50 years before I realized that that's what I was doing. Anyway, back to the study. 
um, it says that people's hormones also change depending on how processed their meals were. And that's interesting. Um, even though people said they felt equally full and satisfied on both diets, the unprocessed diet led to an increase in an appetite suppressing hormone called PYY. PYY. <laughs> and a decrease in the hunger hormone ghrelin, G H R E L I N. Ghrelin. Um, and quoting Hall, he says, both of these hormonal changes took, that took, wait, let me try again. Both of these hormonal changes that took place, for reasons we don't fully understand, tend to support our authorization. On an unprocessed diet, people spontaneously reduce their calorie intake, leading to weight loss and body fat loss, without them having to count calories or even intentionally doing so. So... This, while it doesn't give a clear reason of why this is happening, it's a better support of eating healthy, eating unprocessed foods. Um, one thing I do like in this article, it says, avoiding ultra-processed food isn't easy, especially financially. That is a big one because as a single mom raising my daughter, not, never having enough money for all the stuff, you know, eating cheap was the way to go. And it was expensive to go buy fruits and vegetables when you could buy a, back, a box of mac and cheese and some ramen and, you know, a, a box of the the dry mashed potato mix. You know, all these things are so cheap. And then you go and to buy one carrot, you're, or well, I guess to buy one bunch of carrots, you're spending as much as you did on all of the other stuff. So it's really, you know, it, it, it's hard for a lot of families to eat well. Um, let's see, the ingredients for the unprocessed meals cost about 40% more than for the ultra-processed foods. 40%. But the study provides the latest proof that cutting down on processed foods may be worth the extra price and effort. It is if you can swing it. That's the hard part. Um, one of the things I do like that they do now um, for families that have I guess it's called SNAP now. We used to call it food stamps. <laughs> um, you can, there's like a card or something you can get. You can take it to the farmer's market and they'll give you discounts on fresh fruits and vegetables. And there are other programs. Um, when my daughter was a baby, we, we were in the WIC program. Um, and that was before it changed. I guess it's changed a lot because my daughter was on it as well when she had her son. And there were a lot of things that were different about it. Um, but you still get, you get like peanut butter, you get milk. You know, milk is a good one, you know, um, because that is hard to afford. Especially like here in Hawaii, milk is over $5 a gallon. Um, when we lived in Central Oregon, you could buy it regularly on special, if somebody always had it on special for $1.99 a gallon. That was a big jump for me. I used to be a big milk drinker. I'd drink almost a gallon a day. And that I had to pretty much cut out once I moved over here. Um, so, yes, eating healthier, you know, eating low processed, unprocessed foods are definitely healthier for you. And what I liked about this study was that they actually controlled what everybody ate. So they knew what people were eating. There was no cheating. There was, you know, no misrepresentation. It was, it was there, black and white. 
and they saw the effects of what that was having. And so I'm guessing that in the future, um, they're going to relate this somehow to breast cancer or any other cancer. Um, one thing, going back to that previous study, when I was on the PubMed site, it's um, pubmed.gov, and on the side of the article, it lists similar articles that have been pre previously published. So they're talking about the effect of low-fat diet on breast cancer survival, similar articles, impact of dietary patterns and the main food groups on mortality and recurrence in cancer survivors, sounds like the same thing, responsiveness of, I don't know how to say this word, um, carotenoids to a high vegetable diet designed to prevent breast cancer recurrence, sounds like the same thing. Influence of a diet very high in vegetables, fruit, and fiber, and low in fat on prognosis following treatment for breast cancer. Sounds like the same thing. Dramatic dietary fat reduction is feasible for breast cancer patients. Same thing. Dietary fat reduction and breast cancer outcome results from the Women's Intervention Nutrition Study which is part of what they base this study on, from what I remember on yesterday's article. So, how many times have they done this study? And that's what really blows me away, all the money wasted on these studies, where they're just repeating studies that have been done before. Do something new, people. Come on. Spend money wisely. And this kind of tells you why they're never really coming up with a cure for cancer. It's just all done on studies to tell us the same old thing. So that concludes my diatribe. <laughs> um, personally, I am still dealing with the lymphedema. Uh, it's gotten worse since I can't go back to the MLD. And because my health insurance and this out-of-network hospital can't agree on terms, I'm, I'm the one that's stuck. I'm the one that suffers. So I'm just kind of stuck with it, I guess. If I come up with anything new, I'll let you know. If you have any ideas for lymphedema, put them down below. And I will talk to you when the next study comes out or I am miraculously cured. Bye-bye. <laughs>